as we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name, knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came.
And if you've repented of those sins, here's the good news that I have for you. You are forgiven. <laughs> from the word touches our very soul we've seen your faithfulness and we want you to know pastor we love you and we appreciate all you do and god sees the sacrifice you made for jesus christ your tears and here's the burden you bear the lord's by your side blesses all that you do through the good and bad times he'll see you through pastor we love you we appreciate all you do and god sees And we know one day 
understand that. And if I'm being really honest, I've never said this out loud before, but when I came on a couple Sundays on my vacation days, it was in the hopes that you would want me back. <laughs> and I've never told anyone that before. And uh, I, just, I just love this place. It's so special. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, does somebody else want to take over? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I brought with me today, it's an invitation. How many of you kids have ever received an invitation? Okay, you all have. In, inviting you to what? Now this was, a, this was for my great niece. It was for her graduation party. Um, what other kind of party? What other kind of invitations do you get? Um, when I was, how old was I? I was about seven or eight, and um, I received a card inviting me to bring birthday. She was a friend from first grade. Oh, okay. Very, very nice. Lily? I got an invitation to my aunt's wedding. Oh, a wedding invitation. All right. What about you, Nathan? You ever get invited to anything? Birthday parties. Birthday parties. <laughs> So now the question is, what would happen if you got invited and you didn't want to go? What would you do? Go anyways. Nathan look, is looking real guilty. What'd you say? Go, in, go anyways. Have you been that way, Nathan? No? Okay. <laughs> well, sometimes... Well, at least grown-ups, I don't know about kids, but grown-ups, we get invited and we think, I, there were other things I really wanted to do that day, right? <laughs> and so we make an excuse, that's what we do, we make excuses, we'll say, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be sick that day. <laughs> <laughs> or, I'm sorry, but I have to do this, or I've already made a commitment, and we make excuses, don't we? Now, there's a story in the Bible when Jesus told this story. It comes from Matthew 22, verses 1 through 3. It said, Jesus spoke to them again in the parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused to come. They made excuses, didn't they? They thought of reasons why they didn't have to come. So, in this story, what we're talking about, the king, do you know who the king would be in this story? Um, God. God, very good. The king was God, and do you know who the son was? Jesus. And so, what it is, is an invitation for us to become part of the kingdom of God, to become a follower. And so we still get invitations today, don't we? In scripture, what did Jesus say? He said, come follow me. It's not always easy to go follow Jesus, is it? Because sometimes other kids might make fun of you or say you're, you're foolish for doing that and there is no God, but we know different, don't we? So we accept a call to come follow Jesus, and we don't make excuses. Now we have a video that's super together that I wanna I wanna show you about that. I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me excused, I cannot come. A certain man held a feast on his fine estate in town. He laid a festive table, then for a wedding gown. He sent invitations to his neighbors far and wide. But when the meal was ready, each of them replied, I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet, don't trouble 
I saw a posting on Facebook this week that Landry has passed the 165-day mark with no seizures. I saw that, too. Praise God. So God has really been pouring out his blessings this week. Yay, hey God. <laughs> Anyone else? Doris. Diane, if you guys haven't noticed, last Sunday, I wore my, wore my shirt on the, the wireless shirt, and and last, last week was shirt on the awareness day on the 7th of October. Trigeminal neuralgia awareness oh, okay. day. Okay. Exactly. Don't, don't expect me to repeat that. Though. It's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. My brother, G. 
Father, I want to thank you today to be in this place, to be worshiping with what I call my family, the family you have given me. What an honor it is to serve you and to serve this congregation. And I just thank you for that honor and privilege. Heavenly Father, as we worship you this day, you are the only hope any of us have. But because of the hope that you give us, we can come to this place, worship you with smiles on our faces, and know that someday all wrongs will be made right. Someday we will be at home with you in a perfect place with perfect people. And so we look forward to that time. But Heavenly Father, while we're here, we're not perfected yet. And so we struggle with our flesh. We struggle with the sins that we sometimes have trouble letting go of. But we're grateful because we know that if we persevere, someday, all will be made right. And so we, we're just here this day to praise you for that fact alone, to praise you for the sacrifice that your son was willing to make for each of us. To worship you and to praise you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. And Heavenly Father, we've seen many blessings this week. And we're grateful for the blessing that Jeff is here. We're grateful that Mary Ann went through the surgeries and is doing well, and that Ruth can breathe a sigh of relief. We're grateful that Jen is doing well this week, and we pray for continued healing there. And then we think of little Landry and how well he is doing, and we see your hand in all of it. We also think of Jim, and he's, do, he's doing well. And so we praise you for all those good things. We, we think of Jeremy's neighbor who's doing good, and, and so we just thank you. But we know there are people in need as well, and we lift those people to you, some that we have not mentioned, and some that we have mentioned. We think of Millie this day, and. We, we pray that you will give her comfort, her and her family, just strengthen her and, and be with her. We also think of April and Todd, and they still need your prayers, Heavenly Father, and so our prayers, and so please touch them this day. We think of those dealing with the hurricanes, those dealing with the fires, and we just pray that soon, these things will subside and they will begin to rebuild their lives again. Father, we thank you that we can bring our concerns to you. We thank you for answered prayers. And we thank you that sometimes you don't answer them the way we want, want you to. Because you answer them the way they should be. The right and just way. And so we just, we just praise you this day. And as we think of Jesus, remembering all that he's done for us, that he gave all for us, that should amaze us. We remember the miracles that he performed, the lessons that he taught, and we also remember his prayer to you. This is his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. The first kind of people we see invited to the kingdom of God are those people who refuse. They refuse to come even though they've been invited. They are people that no matter what we say, no matter what we do, they want nothing to do with God or the things of God. They believe that they don't need God in their lives. They're doing just fine without God. Some of them don't even believe that God exists. They don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he's the only way to heaven, the only hope that we have. Now they may believe that Jesus was a man and that he lived. They might even believe that he was a good man, or maybe they even believe he was a prophet, but they do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world. These people will refuse to come to the kingdom of God, and they will never enter the kingdom of God. They will never enter heaven. And as we look at verses 4 and 5, then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fat and cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. There are going to be people that when we present the gospel of Christ that are just going to refuse it, even though they've been invited. And secondly, there are people that will be indifferent to the message, even though they've been invited. Those are the people that say, I'm just too busy to get involved with church. I'm too busy to get involved with the things of God. These are the people that work all week. These are the people that only have Sunday morning to sleep in. Or they only have Sunday to play golf or to go fishing. Or even some of them, that's the only time they can find to spend with their families. Now they don't have a problem with you guys being in worship. It's just that they don't have time. They say things like, I don't have to go to church to worship God. And you know what? That might be true. They might not have to. But if you were committed to God, if, you were, if Christ is your Savior, why wouldn't you want to spend time with other believers, with other Christians? Why wouldn't you want to worship in the fellowship of the saints, in, with the community of believers? These people are the ones that say, someday I'll serve God. Someday I'll get serious about God. Someday, someday, but not today. I just don't have time right now. And the people that are indifferent to God will never enter the kingdom of God. And then we look at verse 6. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Third, there are people invited that will persecute the church. There are people that hate Christians. There are people that will persecute and kill Christians. I think we see that more and more, even in our country, Christianity is being persecuted. Now there's a man named Yusef Nadarkahani, and it, I probably butchered that last name, but he's from Iran. And he became a Christian, a follower of Christ. Not only that, he became a pastor, and he was put into prison because it's illegal to be a Christian in Iran. And so he has been in prison for several years now. And he could face the prospect of, of being put to death. And we see that more and more all over the world. We see that happening. Christians are being persecuted. There are people that persecute the church, and they have been invited. But those are the people that will never enter the kingdom of God because they persecute the church. And in verse 8 it says, Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not come. 
the people who refuse to believe that Jesus died for their sins, the people that are indifferent to the things of God, the people who persecute God's church, they do not deserve and will not be part of the kingdom of God. And I want to say when they do not deserve it, neither do we. But thank God for his mercy and his grace that has been extended to us that when we accept that offer, we are made worthy, his worthiness, not ours. Now, several years ago, there was a survey, and they had a list of names on the survey, and the people were supposed to vote who would get to heaven and who wouldn't get to heaven according to that list. And according to the list, Mother Teresa topped it. 79% of the people thought that she would go to heaven. Next was Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey and 66% of the people thought Oprah would go to heaven. Michael Jordan, 65% thought he would go to heaven. Next was Hillary Clinton, and 55% of the people thought she would go to heaven. And they must not like Bill as much because only 52% of the people <laughs> thought Bill would get to heaven. Dennis Rodman, 28% of the people thought that he would get to heaven. And 19% of the people thought O.J. Simpson was going to go to heaven. And then they were asked, what do you think your odds are of getting into heaven? And they thought the chance was 87%. Can you imagine that? They put themselves ahead of Mother Teresa. They thought they had a better chance of getting in heaven than she did. Folks, some refused to come to the wedding banquet. Now I want to look at those people that did come to the wedding banquet. Let's look at verse 10. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. And if you notice, good people came, and bad people came. There were both kinds of people. Now hear what I say. Good people do not go to heaven because they are good. And bad people do not go to heaven because they are bad. To enter the kingdom of heaven, to enter the kingdom of God, to become part of the family of God, here's the answer. It's the people that wear the right clothes. It's the people that wear, wear the right clothes because many are invited, but few are chosen. In verses 11 through 13, it says, But when the king came to see the guest, he noticed the man there not wearing the wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friends? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now you might think that the king was really harsh with that man who didn't have the right clothes on. But what you need to understand, the wedding clothes were provided. You didn't have to wear your own clothes. They were given to you. The wedding garment had been provided, and the man refused to wear it. Instead, he wore the robe of self-righteousness. He wore the robe of I'm good enough. He wore the robe of I'm better than most. And when we get back to that survey of the odds of getting into heaven, you need to understand there's really only two choices. It's either 100% or zero. There's nothing in between. You're either saved or you're not saved. You either wear the coat of righteousness, which comes from Jesus, his righteousness, or you don't wear it. Here it is, folks. There's only one way to heaven. And that's by wearing the right clothes. So you might ask me, what are the right clothes? You must wear the robe of righteousness. In other words, we must accept Christ as our Savior. We must accept the fact that he's the only way to heaven. And when we get 
to heaven or we stand before God that last day, what he's going to look at is what clothes are we wearing? The cloak of righteousness or not? In other words, are we covered by the blood of Christ? Are we covered with his righteousness? And when Jesus becomes our salvation, we are clothed or covered by his blood. We take on his righteousness. Now there was a story of a man named Ken, and he worked in Alaska in the 70s. And he was there a year, and at the end of the year, he had made $30,000, which was a nice chunk of change in the 70s. So he went home, and within a month of being home, he spent every cent and was broke. So he went back to Alaska, and he worked six more months. And in that six months, he made $18,000. So when he came home, he thought, I have to do something different, different. I can't do the same thing. He decided that he would go to church. <clears throat> and so he went to church. He sat in the back row. He was in kind of ragged clothes and his flannel shirt and jeans. And, and he had a beard. It kind of looked like Grizzly Adams is who he looked like. But during that service, when there was a call to the altar, he came forward. He accepted Christ as a savior as tears rolled down his face. So the next week, when Ken went back to church, no one recognized him. He had cleanly shaven, he had a three-piece suit. And when asked why he did that, he said, because God so changed me on the inside that I wanted to change on the outside so people would know that I'm different. The wardrobe that God is talking about this day is on the inside. Have you been changed on the inside? You have been invited. Jesus has provided your clothes. And the fact is this, someday we will face judgment on that last day, if we're not wearing the right clothes, we'll be thrown out. Or we will be allowed to stay. It all depends on what you wear. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that we don't have to be perfect. We thank you that we become more and more like Jesus every day, though we have ways to go. We thank you that you have given us clothes to wear. And that day when we stand before you, you will see your son's righteousness and not our shortcomings. Heavenly oh, Father, if there's just one person here that hasn't accepted the offer of salvation, that hasn't decided to wear the robe of righteousness, today's the day. We're so grateful we have that choice. We're grateful that you love us so much. We are so grateful this day to be called your children. In the name of our Son, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Softly and tender is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home.